See, everyone remembers Star Wars and Star Trek. But see, there's other sci-fi voices of shows and people that we might forget. So if you haven't thought of Dollhouse, Classic Battlestar, or Babylon 5 in a while, you, you gotta listen in. It's a sci-fi diner classic, voices from a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. It's a sci-fi diner classic, bringing you voices from the past, no we ain't here or there. It's a sci-fi diner classic, don't give me no news, just give me interviews and nothing else, no nothing else. Welcome to the Sci-Fi Diner Classic. This is episode 9, I believe. Is that right, Miles? I believe it's episode 9. Mm -hmm. And we have on our Sci-Fi Diner Classic an interview we did a very long time ago. I can't believe it's been this long. I know. With Dayton Ward, mm -hmm. of all people. Who is Dayton Ward? Dayton Ward is a Star Trek uh, novel author um, and a, a guest we've had on our show a few times, along with his writing partner, Kevin Dilmore. Uh, Dayton Ward uh, has written some of my favorite Star Trek novels over the past two years, and uh, as as he says, he likes to troll the other social media sites. And so, funny guy, if you ever get to see some of his stuff that he's putting out there, it's that deadpan humor. It's it, a, it's it, a, yeah, and it's just hilarious. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'll see some of that come through the the interview that we do with him. Uh, most recently, helping finish up the Vanguard series. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. So Star Trek Vanguard. He's been reading those novelizations. Are you into the novelizations of Star Trek? He is phenomenal mm -hmm. and, and a great writer and just a great person all to, all, and all in all, and you know, all the mm -hmm. way through. Somebody you and I look forward to seeing every year. We will leave. see him at the uh, upcoming cons. That's for yes. sure. Mm -hmm. So very good. So, is there anything else that needs to be said about Dayton? Um, I think you'll really like this guy. Uh, he's a f um, great author, funny guy. Yeah. Uh, I hope you enjoy this interview. Yep. And this is the man that Aaron Rosenberg would take to lunch. So enjoy the interview. All right, well, welcome back to the Sci-Fi Diner Podcast. Miles, we have a very special guest here tonight. We do. And uh, this is none other than Dayton Ward, uh, who we met at Shore Leave this past year. Miles, had you met Dayton before? Um, no, I have not, um, except through um, some email exchange and through uh, a TrekCast. Right, through TrekCast and hearing him in there because he's been on there for some time. Anyways, Dayton's been around, uh, has written tons of Star Trek novels and uh, has been probably written a lot more that we're going to talk about. Dayton, welcome to the show. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on. Hey, it is awesome to have you here. It's been awesome to just kind of follow you on Twitter and just find out about who you are a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. I was gonna say, if you're following me on Twitter, it's probably more for worse than better. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know. You always, you know, retweet some of these, some of the most interesting conversations, like the people at Walmart. And... Well, uh, you know how people retweet stuff from their friends list, and your friends don't necessarily overlap with their friends list, so it takes on this viral thing. You know, particularly if somebody says something really funny. <laughs> oh, oh. So, and there's a lot of that going on. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself, first of all. You know, who is Dayton Ward? I kind of when I when I thought about that question, I kept picturing that whole M and M song, right? Will the real Dayton Ward please stand up? But <laughs> yeah. Well the, the the real Dayton Ward is a forty something IT guy by day. Uh and then at night, you know, I'd put on my secret uh costume and try to be a writer. Uh been doing that professionally for about twelve years now. So you've been working two jobs basically. Yeah, two jobs. And then, uh, now I'm a father, so that's three jobs. So, <laughs> it is. So I essentially decided I'm not going to sleep until the year 2028 20, or something. I think that's what I figured out. So, <laughs> so lots of caffeine or something in your system to keep I, you going. Yeah, I, main, I mainline Mountain Dew. <laughs> <laughs> hey, whatever works, whatever works. That's my gateway drug. <laughs> Tell us, how, how would sci-fi fans know you? Most would probably know me through Star Trek. Um, I have written a lot of Star Trek material for pocketbooks over the last 10 years or so. Uh, I got my start uh, with their 
amateur writing contest, Strange New Worlds, that started in 1997. I had a story selected for that first anthology and then managed to put a story in the following two years anthologies. And then at that point, I rendered myself eligible for what they were calling an amateur contest. Uh, and the editor there at Pocket Books at the time, John Ordover, asked me if I was interested in writing a Star Trek novel for him. So being stupid, I said, sure. <laughs> uh, and the rest, as they say, is a mystery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, that's that's kind of, I really sort of backed my way into it. Yeah, you, I mean, it's definitely not the road that most people take. And I've been very lucky along the way. Obviously, I've been able to work with a lot of really neat writers and made a lot of friends along the way. So it's been quite a ride. Dayton, did you, ha- did you go to school for uh, writing? Did no, you- not really. Uh, I mean, I didn't, I didn't really have an aspiration to be a writer when I was a kid growing up. That wasn't my, uh, my dream job uh, or wasn't my dream vocation or, or anything like that. Um, I kind of fell into writing just sort of uh, as something to do one one time, uh, not to dismiss it and the hard work that other writers do. I just kind of took it up because I wanted to try my hand at it because I'd been reading other people's fiction and decided that it might be something I would try for fun. And so I wrote a lot of fan fiction. And then eventually Pocket Books came along with this contest, which was essentially licensed fan fiction, to put it very simplistically. And so I was essentially dared by a friend of mine to enter a story in that first contest. Ooh. And so I took her dare, uh, you know, because she called my manhood into question, and you just can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Absolutely uh, not. I, so I submitted that story, and that's what happened. Oh, awesome. I mean, you said fan fiction. Essentially, that's what a Star Trek novel is. It's an extended piece of fan fiction that you kind of have been licensed to write. Yeah, I mean, it, it, when you boil it away, yeah, it is licensed fan fiction. But you know, the the big the big difference between true fan fiction and what the studio lets you do is, you know, of course they get the final say, and they have expectations on how they expect properties to be treated and their characters to be treated. So you're not going to be able to do just anything. Whereas in the world of fan fiction. You know, the sky's the limit. You can do anything you want. Right. Uh, and there's a lot of fun to be had there. Uh, I had a lot of fun writing fan fiction stories, and I still, you know, have fond memories of the ones that I wrote. So uh, it was a, I, I don't know that it's a stepping stone for everybody, but it just happened to work out that it was a stepping stone for me. Mm-hmm. Cool. Now, besides uh, Star Trek, what, what other sci fi did you grow up with, or did you like, or do you like? Well, I grew up in the early 70s, so at the time, that was Star Trek and reruns on TV were you know, just getting going. And you know, Planet of the Apes and 2001 were probably the, the, the highest caliber, quote, film science fiction going on at that time. Then the rest of it was all the B-movies you know, from the 50s and the early 60s. So I watched a lot of that stuff on Saturday afternoon TV, you know, like The War of the Worlds and The Time, to- or the time Machine and The Day the Earth Stood Still and – I read a lot of science fiction when I started going to school, uh, and I read a lot of stuff like Joe Haldeman and Robert Heinlein and Arthur Clarke, and I still read those authors to this day. So that's where I kind of got my start in science fiction. But I mean, in the 70s was also the era of you know, Space 1999 and Battlestar Galactica and Buck Rogers and you know a lot of stuff that's probably best forgotten. <laughs> oh, yeah. What's on TV right now that uh, you're watching on sci-fi, or do you watch sci-fi TV? Well, let's see. Right now, Do you have time? at the moment, <laughs> yeah, I have a lot. Let's put it this way: I have a big DVR, um, <laughs> and then I try to carve it out in in uh, chunks when I get a chance. Right now, I guess the closest thing to sci-fi that I'm watching with any regularity is that new Flash Forward. Ooh, uh, and even you know that's kind of borderline. At least the way they're showing it on TV is borderline sci-fi. Um, but I've only caught the first three episodes of that one, and everything else is on the, whatever's coming after that is on the DVR. Right, and I watch a lot of I catch a lot of stuff on movies, but uh, I don't know. Um, I'm not. I, I tried the new Stargate, and I wasn't really that jazzed by it. Um, but I was a big fan of the original Stargate movie and the SG One series. Yeah. So. And not of, not of Atlantis. Not so much. I, I, don't, I don't have any active dislike for it. I just didn't like it as much as I liked right. uh, SG. But I love stuff like Farscape, the new Galactica. Um, those are huge fair. I mean, I really got a kick out of the new Galactica. Oh, that was and, us too. Miles and I both like that. Yeah, and uh, we we also are watching Flash Forward and love it. And I'm looking forward to the new. Uh, I'm looking forward to the new reboot of V that's coming uh, next month. I was a big fan of the original miniseries back in the '80s, so I'm looking forward to seeing the new take on it. Yeah, well, and especially uh, they have the uh, girl from Firefly at the helm of that, so. 
Well, how can you go wrong, right? Yeah, yeah, you can't. You can't. <laughs> you, you can't. All the reason to watch it. The, the previews I've seen, you know, I, I'm in. I'm definitely in for to see how it goes. Um, and then we'll. I mean, hopefully ABC won't mess it up. I mean, it seems oh, like man. they're going to schedule it and then immediately preempt it for the Olympics. So I don't. I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know. I, I, yeah, what four episodes before the Olympics and then not till March? I mean, how do you build an audience that way? Well, what, that's funny though. Is you know the, the original miniseries was four hours. <laughs> two hours, two hours over two nights, and that was it. Until and that was going to be it. You know, then they finally decided to do this the the sequel miniseries, which the original guy wasn't even involved in. Uh, so, I guess there's precedent, but yeah, but we're a different viewing audience now. Our attention spans are shorter, and we want everything now, now, now. So, <laughs> yeah, isn't that the truth? I'm one of them too. So, I mean, it's not like I'm putting myself up above everybody. I'm in there too. Like, what the hell are you thinking? And wait until March. Yeah, I know. But uh, yeah, I'm, look, I'm looking forward to it too. Dayton, I wanted to ask you since you're to flash forward. Um, are, are you, have you uh, checked out any of uh, other Robert Robert J. Sawyer's work? I haven't, but you know what? This is enough to make me go and pull some of his backlist. Um, I, here's the thing: as much science fiction as I watch, and, and you can call what I write science fiction, you know, if, you know, charitably, Star Trek is science fiction. Um, I don't really get to read a lot of science fiction these days um, for fun. And I don't get to read a lot for anything for fun. Mm-hmm. And I tend to gravitate away from whatever it is I'm writing for leisure reading. So if I'm writing something that's science fiction, then I tend to gravitate toward like a mystery or a techno thriller or a nonfiction book. So I don't get a chance to really read a lot of luxury science fiction these days. But I'm putting his books on my to be read pile. Well, if you do, I, I've read um, his Hominid series and. Uh, there was one he did on time travel, which I, I don't remember the name of. You know um, what? It was, but it was quite. I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but you're not the first person to recommend that one to me. So I'm, um, I've, I got to go out to Amazon and figure out which ones I want to try. So mm-hmm. now, have, have you read the novel Flash Forward? No, I haven't. No. Like I said, I, I hadn't really touched any of Sawyer stuff until this, and I, I it. When I saw the name of the show on the fall line, I thought that sounds familiar. Where have I heard that before? And I, I knew of the novel, but I had never read it. So I'm going to read it and see how much they've borrowed or not borrowed from the original, you know, book. I heard mm-hmm. I heard an interview with him on uh, Slice of Sci-Fi, and and he was just talking about how the, the concept and the idea remains kind of intact, but uh, the premise and and how they go about it, and even the time length that they black out is a bit different. And uh, uh, he wasn't giving too much away, but it sounds like he kind of gave his blessing on the show. So. Well, I I would imagine, and, and I haven't seen this interview, and I haven't seen any interview of his, but I, I would imagine they what, they speed it up a little bit for purposes of TV. You know, like oh, it's absolutely. not so long. Isn't it something like it takes over? Isn't the book the flash forwards are twenty one years in advance instead of six months or something? Yeah, something like that. So, yeah, I, I can get that because who knows if they're going to even be around this you know next season? So yeah. I guess they're going to try to tell if they're if they're smart, they'll tell a complete story in one season and then. Maybe try something new next year. Yeah. Well, it sounds like they they got the uh, twenty two episodes this season, so we'll see what happens. I just heard that. I guess I guess they got the back nine ordered. So yeah. um, good for them. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a good job. Well, they should with what fourteen million viewers the first the first episode. They should definitely be ordering a full season. ABC would be stupid not to. But I've seen yeah, they stu- need a I, hit. I, I've, seen, <laughs> I've seen stupider things. So who knows? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, with ABC, my, I think the one thing I used to watch with any regular regularity on ABC was Monday Night Football. <laughs> and then when they moved that to ESPN, I really didn't have anything to watch on ABC anymore. So, Oh, man. They need a hit. They do so. definitely need a hit. Well, uh, i like to ask you, for me as a Star Trek fan, one of the things that frustrates me sometimes is that um, on Star Trek, often the producers don't follow through and leave lots of loose ends at the end of an episode. However, as a reader of Star Trek novels, I like that the author will pick up the ball and run with it and take those loose ends and come up with a really great story and then follow through with it follow up on that episode. Um, I heard at the Shirley convention that uh, Star Trek novel authors uh, love loose ends. Uh, do you agree with that? And if you do, if you, if you do or you don't, can you elaborate that on that? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take your approach. Yes. As a viewer watching the show. And if that was all I was watching, I would be saying, why don't they follow that up? Why don't they revisit that character? Or why don't they take us back, you know, to that planet where as a Star Trek writer, I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm writing that down. That's an idea. Mm-hmm. Um, the, yeah, going through an episode and looking at the little dangling plot threads that are potential story springboards, you know, it's a gold mine. You know, 700 plus hours of, of material to go through. 
So, yeah, as a writer of Star Trek fiction, it is it, not that every story is necessarily a dangling plot thread from some episode or a movie, but you know, it's always nice to explore where things might have gone if, right. if, if you know if they had the chance to go back. Um, I love the yeah I love the Mirror Universe novels well and and any any episodes I did with the Mirror Universe. Um, I'm really also enjoying the Vanguard series. Um, um, you'll forgive the expression, but it's almost as if they like took Star Trek: Deep Space Nine and but but told it in the original series timeline. It's not Deep Space Nine, but it's kind of that way in some respects. Um, whose idea was to, was to get that series? Uh, and can you tell us how it came to be? Well, Vanguard, um, for benefit of the readers who or listeners who may not be familiar, is a original series for print that is set during the same time frame as Kirk's five-year mission from the original series. Uh, it takes place in a different part of space, different set of characters, different whole mission. And it was the idea – it was the brainchild of uh, editor Marco Palmieri and writer David Mack. They co-created the, the series and developed the characters and the overall story arc. And they fleshed out a Bible, you know, with where the story would go from A to Z, and but they left the format loose enough that we could necessarily we could tell other stories along the way as we were pursuing this core plot arc. And I, Kevin Dilmore, my writing partner, and I were were brought in to write the second book after Dave wrote the first book in the series called Harbinger. Um, Kevin and I were brought in to sort of. Uh, take the baton from Dave for one book and give it a spin and put our own spin on the characters and advance the plot line to a certain point or plot lines because there are multiple plot lines going on in this series. Right. And at, after we turned in that book, um, which was called Summon the Thunder, editor Marco Palmieri decided that he liked the idea of a two-author team tandem going back and forth between the two books. Or between the books. So like Dave would write the odd numbered books and Kevin and I would write the even numbered books and we would just bat it back and forth. And it became a game of sorts between us as we tried to one up each other <laughs> in successive book. So, you know, Dave would blow up a ship in the first book, we'd blow up a planet. You know, he we blow up a planet, he blows up a whole solar system and you know, or or worse to you know one joking example, but um, it's it's been a lot of fun because what happens is even though we know the core storyline, we don't necessarily know everything that's going to happen in a particular book. So we'll lay out our outline and we'll give it to the editor and he'll approve or disapprove any elements of it. And I guess this last time around, he didn't share the outline from our book with Dave <laughs> until after we had turned in our manuscript. So Dave sat down to write what is going to be book five that's coming later this year. And only then did he get to read what we had written for book four. And so, of course, if you've read book four, I'm not going to spoil it for anybody, but it's a big holy God moment at the end of the book four. <laughs> and I, we essentially just threw it over the wall to see what he'd do with it. I mean, we, there were reasons for it that will become clear as the story unfolds, but it was more you – know, he. it was our response to, what, to something he did to us at the end of his third book. <laughs> it was revenge. It was. So. <laughs> and did you get any response from him? Oh, he was very pissed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in a good nature way. He called me up and said, you know, what the hell are you doing? And uh, I think I heard an interview where he was talking to somebody where he cursed our names for leaving him uh, in a, in a, in a uh, lurch like that. Not really. I mean, we, uh, we had a very long conversation about where to go from there and how this fed into the storyline. And we weren't just doing it for the, for the joke moment. Um, it all works out and it actually added a layer of complexity to the storyline that wasn't previously there. So, uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's, it's, it's as much fun collaborating with the editor and the other, and Dave, uh, as it is actually writing our books. So awesome. You know, I, uh, we had a friend of ours who actually wrote in when I asked about questions for tonight. I kind of forwarded this one just to kind of give you a heads up for it. But, you sure. know, if, if you're a, you know, if you are a fan of the movies or a fan of maybe some, uh, the, the, the trek that's been out there, especially the new movie, and you want to get into the novelizations, is, is there, I mean, there's, there are a gazillion novels out there. You go to the Star Trek section of any major bookstore. <laughs> you go to Amazon.com and you type in Star Trek novel and you get, you know, 1,001 novels. Where does, where does one start? Well, I guess you'd have to start with, you know, where's your favorite? Do you have a favorite series or, you know, more than one favorite series and then uh, pursue the books that tie into that series? 
um, that's a good starting place. I mean, if so, for example, if you're a DS9 fan, and there are a lot of those guys lately, you know, guys and gals out there who love DS9, you know, there's a series of books that take up the story from where their show left off, and they've been going strong now for going on five years. So the plot lines continue even after the end of the the, the actual television series. Mm-hmm. Um, all of the all of the 24th century era shows, Next Generation, DS9, Voyager, they all have continuations beyond their last film or television episode. Uh, and those have been executed to varying degrees of commercial and critical success. Um, but you know, each each one has been taken by a different editor, and they've got a different idea. They're, of course, they're trying to make them unique in of, of themselves instead of just tying into one another for one big happy story, you know, wank. Um, but DS9, I think, is the one that's probably got the most complexity in terms of its evolving storylines beyond the television show. Hmm. Uh, only because it's around, it's been around the longest, and it was sort of the first one to really try this. You know, a, okay. a really comprehensive approach to a post-series uh, storyline. Hmm. Now, I mean, yeah, I just, go ahead. just oh, I just finished reading um, the last Voyager novel, uh, Unworthy. Uh, it's interesting to see where they're going with uh, Voyager in the uh, um, in the extended universe. Yeah, uh, Kirsten, Kirsten Byer is trying to bring that that weight of storytelling that's been enjoyed by the DS9 books to the Voyager series. Um, you know, Voyager, mm-hmm. when they got back to the Alpha Quadrant, you know, they were going to be next generation two. So they had to come up with something unique to give to give Voyager its own identity. So uh, I, I thought they, I thought she succeeded. I was. Uh, I, uh, She'd be happy to hear that. Yeah. Good. <laughs> she really poured a lot of blood and sweat into those two books. She labored for a long time on those two books, um, yeah. not just because she had a pretty tall order, you know, which was continuing the storyline, but also because she was trying to work in and around the havoc that David Mack, you know, wrought with his Destiny trilogy. No. <laughs> which, for oh those who God. are, yeah, for those who don't follow at home, you know, he basically upended the 24th century Star Trek era with his Destiny trilogy. So and they're still picking up the pieces from that. <laughs> well, you know, that was that was an enjoyable series and a hard series to read at the same time. The destiny, the, the, the destiny, uh, um, hard in what way? Just um, I, I, I guess um, maybe just shattered my illusions. I mean, uh, <laughs> you think, I mean, well, the Federation just dealt doing a, a devastating war with uh, the Dominion, and they're you know pick up the pieces from there and then you know the Borg basically come in and nearly decimates the Federation um, and it, at least for the TV series it seemed like they had achieved so much and, and but the Borg almost brings um, some Federation worlds to like um, as much as 21st century to allows almost like a third world type thing which will make for good storytelling well, I think it was important. The Destiny trilogy serves as a, a nice uh, reminder that you know tie-in fiction doesn't have to be cookie cutter, clean ending, always stay in the confines of the tie-in box. You know that the producers of the shows, the movies, allow you to operate within. Um, now that Star Trek, you know, prior to the new movie, Star Trek was largely inactive as far as any television or film production. So this, you know, there was nothing going on, and the studio essentially allowed Pockets to chart its own directions with some of these stories, with some of these series, with the, with the established characters. And, you know, for you know, tie-in fiction has a, has a reputation, and deservedly so, of having to remain within the parameters of you know, the, the producer's wishes so far as the individual property is concerned. You can't go this way. You can't go too far afield. You can't do X with this character. You can't kill people off, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But now... There's a lot of freedom, and you know nobody's safe, and we can develop new characters, or we can kill off old characters. Not that that's something that's high on the list of things to do, but it just is. It's a way of demonstrating that this doesn't have to be um, generic, bland, mediocre. You know, same different month. You know, new month, different book type storytelling. So uh, I, for one, am kind of uh, jazzed about it because a lot of those Star Trek novels from the '80s were kind of. They, they felt the same. You know, it seemed like the same adventure every month. So. You know, that kind of uh, uh, brings in a question I had, and I know that 
This was a question. Uh, I'm more familiar with the Star Wars universe because it's kind of what I grew up on in the, in the tie-in novels there. And the discussion is always what's canon and what's not canon. What do we establish as right? And is that even a discussion worth having? How does that play into the Star Trek universe, especially as a writer? I mean, are there any novels that are considered canon or is it the movies, the TV? I mean, what do you, how do you answer that? The general rule of thumb for Star Trek is the television series and the films are canon. Everything else is not. Uh, there are no canon novels, and uh, not that that not that writers of TV episodes haven't gone to the novels maybe for inspiration on from time to time, but that doesn't make that novel canon. Um, and it's an important. I mean, to me, a lot of people make a lot out of the canon debate than that really it deserves. Um, the only people who really should care about canon are the people who make the films and the TV shows or the people who are required to abide by them when they're writing licensed you know, f- comic books or novels or role-playing games or video games or things like that. Everybody else should just have a good time. I don't know why everybody obsesses about, you know, I can't read this novel and enjoy it because it's not canon. Uh, I don't understand. I mean, I, that's not my particular kink. I can't really uh, get understand that i don't i don't need a guy in hollywood to tell me that this book is real before i can read it and enjoy it yeah well you know and that's uh and that's uh there's a lot of truth to that. i mean you as a writer certainly are not confined then by trying to you know worry about what's canon can i say this can i not say this can i have this character do this it certainly frees you up as a writer not to have to think about canon i mean Well, I mean, you know, again, we're required to remain consistent with the canon as it is when we're writing our book. Now, if a you know if a television episode comes along a year from now and and wipes out whatever I did in my book, that's just the way it goes, and I've had that happen. So, uh, you know, you 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 drink a beer, you take a shower because that's life in the (laughs) NBA. So, um, no, I mean, but I mean, every tie-in writer knows that going in that. uh, Their work may be superseded by a, a film or a television show or whatever. That's just the way it is in this in the tie-in world, and I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't know too. I don't get too deep into the canon wars as far as Star Wars is concerned. But you know, their books aren't canon either. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> so, no, so. They, no, they definitely aren't. But now, now that does bring up a question, though. Do you write anything but Star Trek, or do you write anything else uh, other than Star Trek? Maybe is a better oh, way yeah. of saying that. Uh, I'm. I have more Star Trek output than I do other stuff, but I do write other stuff as well. To date, I've got two science fiction novels of my own that have been published, and a third is on the way. It'll be out next year. Um, I've done some science fiction and horror short stories. Um, as far as other tie-in work, uh, Kevin Dilmore and I wrote a novel for the series The 4400 uh, that came out last year. My output is largely Star Trek, but I'm trying to carve my way into doing more original fiction. And I read that book, and I, and I enjoyed it immensely. I'm uh, sorry, which one? Uh, uh, what one you and well, I, I've enjoyed them all, but um, the one that you you and Kevin wrote, uh, Wet Work. Uh, oh, Wet Work. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. We had a lot of fun right now, and because we are we were fans of the show from day one, so when the opportunity came along to to write a book in that series, we jumped at it. Um, yeah. And I'm glad the, the show's was funny. Listening. Well, I mean, we were writing it while the show was still on, and then but before it was canceled, before we even turned in our manuscript. So oh. uh, we were, you know, operating within the confines of quote canon. There's that word again. Yeah. Uh, so we picked, you know, we, because of the heavily serialized nature of that show, we tried to write a story that could fit kind of between a couple of episodes uh, before the, the serialization really got out of hand. As is the nature of an Irish Stephen Bear show. Uh, that guy loved to serialize, and it's more fun for that. Um, so we were able to pick a, a couple of episodes and kind of stick a adventure right there between them, and we think we did it pretty seamlessly. Uh, we most of the fans who've written us about the book say that it fits perfectly within the the show's framework. So we're happy with the result. Well, that has to make that has to feel good as an author, then getting that sort of feedback as well. What is the uh, what are the names of the you, you mentioned that you're working on you were, you did you released two novels that were kind of independent your own what were the names of those the first one was called the last world war it came out in 2003 it's sort of a military science fiction book um, set in the present day but you know aliens come to earth and kick all our asses <laughs> I'm sorry uh, hopefully I, hopefully I'm allowed to curse sorry uh, about that we don't, we don't like it too, too right, you too. can believe it you can yeah, believe beep. it um, and then uh, the other one was called The Genesis Protocol, which was sort of a Jurassic Park meets Predator with a little bit of Southern comfort thrown in for flavor. I did that for a small publisher called Phobos Books, which was actually headed up by Jen Orver, who had at that time left Pocket Books to start his own 
publishing, or he got involved in a, with a smaller publishing company. He was trying to uh, start up his own little imprint there. So I sort of he invited me to write a book for him, and uh, we hashed out that storyline based on an idea he gave me, and I went from there. And then the the third book is that's coming out next year is a sequel to the last world war called uh, counter strike. Uh, I finally get to finish that story that's been hanging there for about, it'll be seven years when this book comes out. Wow. And that's due out when it comes out April, 2010. All right. All right. Well, that'll be good. I'm, be, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, getting hold of it and reading it. So I got to read the first one. So world war, the first, the last world war. So it'll be good. Uh, just one other question before we get some details and uh, kind of wrap up the interview. Uh, we, we, of course, were having this conversation on Twitter. And uh, for those of you that weren't following this, uh, Rondi Moore came out with a conversation about writing Star Trek and the whole, whole idea of, of you know how easy it was to write the scripts because you didn't worry about the terminology and you would just insert tech into the script. Uh, and we had this conversation and you had kind of responded to this on the forums. But for those people that may not you know, hop to the forums and listen to it, I thought maybe we could just clarify the statement that we kind of put into our last show, unbeknownst to you, and we kind of fleshed out. If you wanted to just comment a little bit more on what, the, what he meant by writing tech in Star Trek. Well, I don't know if it's what he meant, but this is what I took from it. Um, okay. I had heard him answer this question about writing the scripts and, and inserting the word tech in lieu of some string of techno babble. My understanding was that they kind of knew what they wanted to do, but they didn't necessarily know how to say it. And they weren't getting hung up on the terminology. They were just, you know, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll put the word tech here and the science consultant will help me put the right terminology in here. Um, that's how I took it because that's a largely – how I've done it when I come up upon you know when I come upon a scientific or an engineering principle that I don't fully understand, uh, you know I, I I hate to stop what I'm doing to go digging into a book or the internet to try to flesh out this idea at that moment. I'd rather keep writing the story because the words are flowing. So I put a marker in my manuscript to come back to it so I can figure out you know I, like I said I know the nuts and bolts about what I want or a general idea of what I want to say I just don't know how to convey it in a way that makes sense to the reader. So I just mark it in my manuscript and I keep pushing forward and I come back to it. And then I rewrite my manuscript as necessary once I figure out what it is I'm actually trying to put in there. I think that's what he meant. And, and that makes sense. I, in his world you know, of television writing, they operate under such ridiculous deadlines that they have to do it in a team environment. They, you know, One guy can't do it all, and that's why they hire these consultants. That's why military shows have military consultants. And uh, you know, Sequest had you know Robert Ballard as a science and undersea exploration consultant because they didn't know that stuff. Um, I, I think that's where he's coming from, but I think he kind of glossed over that for the purposes of that question in that venue more for comedic effect than anything else. Yeah, um, well, it certainly, I mean, certainly was effective. Go ahead. Well, I mean, he's if you've watched the shows where he played a larger role than simply a staff writer, because that's, that's important to remember. On Next Gen, he was largely just a staff writer, right. whereas DS Nine, you know, he was more in the he was he had a, he had a larger hand in the direction of the series, and definitely, you know, when he went to Battlestar Galactica, when he was running the whole show, you could tell he really never liked all that technical jargon. Yeah. Um, uh, Battlestar Galactica pretty much avoided it as much as possible. And you know, DS9 um, for for a large part uh, tend not to rely upon it. Yeah, you said you certainly did not see that sort of techno babble at Battlestar. I mean, they they avoided tech as much as possible, even the way they structured the Galactica. So, oh yeah, like an old World War II battle wagon. Yeah, it really, it really, I'm, I'm it sure was. it was deliberate. I mean, I mean, I know it was deliberate, and it looked great. And I still love that phone that Adama used to carry you know, or had on the on the in the command center. You know, that that phone with the cord on it. <laughs> yeah. Something you just don't expect to see in sci-fi usually. Very, very he was cool. definitely more low tech, but I, I, I think what he did was he, you know, where Star Man, I, I love Star Trek, always will, but almost that the tech becomes too much par- part of the story. Where in, in, in uh, BSG, it just it helped, you know, if if it needed to help tell the story, you know, it, it would, but it wouldn't upstage the characters or, or the plot or anything. I think so, and I, I mean, I, and I, again, I think that's. I don't think he was trying to be insulting or dismissive of Star Trek. I mean, I mean, it, it, Dex Gen and Voyager kind of fell into a formula where they had you know these sorts of plot lines that relied a lot on science and, and quote technology to, to get by. Where 
I don't think that was just that wasn't the type of story he preferred to tell. Uh, mm-hmm. He preferred stories that relied on the characters and their wits. And uh, you know, it's just a storytelling preference. I don't think he meant anything disrespectful by those comments. And I, like I, I think he kind of glossed it over a little bit for 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 the effect in that venue. Right. So. Right. Anyways, before we go here, Dayton, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell people where they can find you, how they can follow you on Twitter, and where they can go ahead and buy those books you write. Well, you can find my books at any uh, major bookstore chain, Borders, Barnes & Noble, Walden Books, if they still have those, Uh, and of course, Amazon.com, and you can find me on the web at DaytonMoore.com, and from there, I have a gateway that will lead you to all the social networking sites that I am stalking, you know, Twitter, (laughs) Facebook, MySpace. Uh, I'm out there as Dayton Ward on all those uh, venues. Good, I keep good. it simple, and just look for the screaming avatar. You'll, you'll. You know, I, I have the same avatar on all those apps. So yeah, it's quite frightening when you see it. <laughs> no, it's good. Well, <laughs> well, thanks so much for coming on the show tonight, Dayton. Uh, we appreciate having you on. Thanks, I appreciate it. All right. Well, we'll take care. Yeah, we'll chat soon. Thanks. All right, take care, guys. All right. Bye. Bye.